Welcome to this episode of Revelations from Heaven. My name is Randy Kay, and my guest today is Ed Zoza, and he was a pilot, but he got into a car crash. It was absolutely devastating. And we're going to be talking about his book, The Mystic Next Door. I love that book. I've read it. I'm going to read the, uh, the subtitle here because my memory is not that good. The Mystic Next Door, An Ordinary Man's Extraordinary Encounter with the Holy Spirit. So, Ed, it's great to have you with us today. Hey, Randy, thank you. I'm uh, really excited and happy to be here. Uh, really looking forward to the talk. Well, Ed, we've got some, uh, as, as Desi used to say to Lucy in the I Love Lucy show, some splaining to do. So uh, do. there's a lot of it. But uh, I am going to, we're reversing order here, here a little bit. I'm going to ask you to pray up front as opposed to the end of this message. And uh, if you will be kind enough uh, to do so. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks. In the Father, and in the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolations. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, you notice that Ed is Catholic, and I invite our Catholic friends to join us. And uh, for our friends who are non-Catholic, um, this is a lesson for all of us that, that God is our Lord. We worship the same God, the same Bible. Uh, and there may be different practices, but we're going to enter into today uh, with my guest Ed some uh, terms that may have been relegated to a different practice outside of the Judeo-Christian faith, which both of us, and hopefully you, ascribe to. And if not, we're going to invite you to do so. Uh, but we're going to also talk about uh, the mystic realm, obviously the title, Ed, of your, of your book. So let, let's begin. We're going to get into uh, the accident that led you to uh, your experiences with the Holy Spirit, which are absolutely mind-blowing, I've got to say. And I've had a lot of experiences in interviewing Gas Ed, but yours <laughs> well, is grown, very too. unique. Yes, I love it. I mean, we're going to get to a space where I was reading in your book uh, what this was, and I'm saying, whoa, this is taking me to a different place. But uh, let's let's talk about Mystic up front, because you had debated... Uh, in your book, The Mystic Next Door, uh, about that, and you decided, based on what the Lord was speaking to you, that you would stick to that, because uh, we were talking about before this that you were taking back the narrative. So share with us a little bit about that so we can uh, visit the, the elephant in the corner, if you will. Yeah, you know, so, you know, modern day, people think of mystic and mysticism as like New Age, as you said. And that's just, you know, 2,000 years ago in the time of Christ with early church fathers and the writers of the, of the scripture themselves. The, these guys were mystics. They were, they were living in another world. They were, they were, they were conversing with the Lord. And, and, and that was just normal for, you know, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 years. And then this new age comes and, and like everything, the enemy tries to twist and pervert what is good and they steal the, the, the name mystic, right? And now it means something to them completely different. But um, I, I wasn't really on board with the name because of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't want people to think, oh, they're going to think it's a book about crystals or, you know, energies. And, and that's just not what it's about. It's, it's really a book about, it's a, it's a book about scripture. I mean, interacting with the Lord and, what finally got me uh, to it was, you know, as a Catholic, you know, I, I study the saints. And it's a great, you know, these were some great men and women that came before us that were incredibly close with the Lord. And they, they themselves were receiving messages and, and, and they have a lot to teach us. And St. Ignatius of Loyola would contend, he would tell people that everyone is a mystic because the Lord speaks to all of us all the time. And it's just whether or not we awaken to that and we accept it or we believe it, 
but it, it's it's happening. And so when when he said that, I thought, yeah, you know, maybe the mystic next door because I'm I'm just a regular guy. I'm I'm not a theologian. I didn't go to any kind of schooling for for religion in any way. I mean, I have a science background, an airline pilot, um, and so the things that I know about the Lord, you know, they've mostly come to me because of this connection, this mystical experience, these experiences. And so uh, it ends up that the title became very fitting uh, because I'm just the guy next door having these experiences that I never, you know, six years ago, if you told me that I'd be on this show talking to you about this, I'd have told you you were crazy. That's not me. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, my 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 Protestant brothers and sisters are much better than most Catholics at going out and evangelizing and speaking. And, you know, the Catholicism, I, I always believed was a very, it's very private between me and, and my Lord, and that's it. And, and it's not. The Great Commission calls us all to go out. And so here I am, I'm a Catholic evangelizing, and we all should be. And, and so, um, uh, that, that's where I am. And, and, and while we're on that, you know, there's a few things. I always lay down some ground rules when I give my talk. Um, you know, I am, I, I used to say I'm not special. And, and I, I, I changed what I say about that because what I want to say now is, is I'm not different. We're all special to the Lord. We are all his favorite, all of us, each one his favorite. And, and so I am special in that way, but I'm not different than you or anybody else in your audience. Uh, and why he chose me to, to tell this message, I, I have no idea, um, but he gave it to me. And uh, what a sin it would be if I didn't tell it. And, and, and you know, it, it's, a, it's a burden on me because I want to I shout this message from the rooftops all the time, every day. And so, again, I'm very appreciative of, of your, you know, your offer and, and the opportunity to speak with you. Um, but, you know, it, I'm going to talk about, about God. He, he is a real, living, tangible physical and spiritual being that touches and holds each of our souls. And these are some truths that came back with me. Not all of the things that I knew in that other realm came back, but, but there are indeed certain things. And uh, as I go through my story and I tell of things that were happening to me or being told to me, uh, you have to understand that I was, uh, I, it was explained to me that when, he, when it was explained to me that way, it's for all of us. It's mm -hmm. not just me. So that's why I say I'm not, I'm not different in any way. What he told me, what I, what I learned, what I've experienced, it applies to all of us. And so that's something we need to know. I, I, again, and it goes back to the mystic next door. I am just a regular, ordinary guy driving down the road that nearly gets killed in a head-on collision. And it can mm -hmm. happen to anybody. And <laughs> it's at his choosing of, of who he reveals us to. But, but it, who he does reveal to it's our obligation to let everyone know. Yeah. We're going to be showing some pictures in a little bit, Ed, uh, oh. of your car crash and, and uh, what happened, you being in the hospital. And, oh, my goodness. I've got to say when uh, we, we have um, a team of people who look at various stories, and we talked about earlier in the, uh, before we got on about uh, the Lord's objective, uh, if you will, for for me was to take taking back the narrative for Christ centered, uh, Christ honoring stories about uh, the near death or afterlife, and uh, yours being one of them. But when when first the mystic next door, I heard about that. Somebody brought it to my attention, and I thought, okay, well, you know, we we do just Christ honoring stories, and so this person said, well, you've got to you've got to look at uh, this further. So I got your book, I read it. And you made me a convert to, <laughs> yes, we're going to be taking back some territory here today. Um, I just want to briefly, if I can, mention uh, the dictionary term for mystic. Because people were calling you in your neighborhood the mystic, uh, the guy, the mystic next door, right? That's where you got yeah. your title. They were saying yeah. you're the mystic next door. So here's, yeah. here's the, here's the uh, dictionary, I think the Webster's, but, uh, or Wikipedia. It is a mystic as a person who speaks by contemplation to obtain unity with God and who believes in the spiritual apprehension of truths beyond the intellect. 
And Paul said that himself. He said, uh, it's under, it's, there is uh, an understanding that surpasses our intellect, that is beyond our understanding, that is the, the comprehension of something. So that's entirely within Scripture, that, that this is the realm in which we live when we talk about near death, entering into the afterlife, entering into the space. And yours, and in particular, came at a point where you were, uh, I don't know if you could call yourself the average family, but you had a great family. Um, you're a pilot, you're successful, yeah. you're driving on the road, <clears throat> and then all of a sudden, bang, your life changes dramatically. Like everything, yeah. I, you know, I, on that day, if uh, here, the, the, the thing about that is, on that day, that morning, when I woke up, if you would have asked me, are you going to heaven? I said, yeah, of course I am. I'm Christian. I go to church most of the time. Uh, I'm not that bad. I'm not killing people. I'm not stealing. I'm not doing the really bad things. Um, and then I'm driving down the road and we get hit head on. Uh, myself, uh, two of my three children and a neighbor boy. Um, and man, it is just, it's just violent. I mean, out of nowhere, we're, we live in the farm country in Indiana, and it, I can see straight ahead a mile and a half, and I can see in my rearview mirror a mile and a half, and there's nothing except there's a tractor coming the other way. It's planting season, it's in May, and uh, behind them is a little gaggle of cars, you know, going slowly behind them, and I have no reason to believe that there's anything bad going to happen, and as we pass that tractor, the car literally explodes like a bomb went off. I mean, and it is spinning and bucking and I am instantly blind. I can't see everything is white and uh, end up coming to rest. And my vision returns as the airbag deflates. And I'm actually in a field now uh, and the car has turned uh, almost 180 degrees from the direction we were going. And I'm, I'm looking through the empty farm fields. I'm looking at my house. It's less than a quarter mile away. And I know that I'm not to be back there for a really long time and then um then i started thinking it, it's so sensational i think this has to be a dream because everything was foggy uh and and the really strange thing and we'll get to it later in the story is is i felt like i was stuck somewhere else like only part of me was here and, and the world seemed foggy and it, it wasn't foggy because anything changed it always was foggy and I never realized it, but it was hazy. And, and, and then I started thinking, okay, well, I'm going to wake up at any moment. And then the pain, I started noticing the pain and it's like the, the pain was getting really intense. And I thought, okay, I'm going to wake up. I should be waking up. And then I realized I can't breathe. I, I, I mean, I, I can't inhale. I, I can't get any air into my lungs. I'm thinking, okay, wake up wake up, this is a bad dream. And then you, you realize finally that the, the, the pain is so overwhelming and the suffocation and, and you think, I realize, okay, uh, this is real. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I immediately look over and uh, I can see my daughter, she was in the passenger seat and, and she's out of the car and she's dialing on her phone. And I think, okay, good, she's getting help. And I, I try to look in the back seat, but I can't, I'm absolutely pinned. I can't even turn my head. I was looking for my son who was on the passenger side. And as I'm trying to look, I, I see him walk by my daughter. So I know two, my two kids that are with me are alive. And there's still the, the young boy that's behind me. And um, uh, in, in a very short while, he wakes up yelling. He, he got knocked briefly unconscious and then uh, he woke up uh, yelling. So I know he was at least alive, but I, I couldn't see anything beyond that. And, uh, you know, like I said, uh, going into that crash that day, I thought I was doing well. But what, what was happening, I was, I was living very well, and I was living by the world standards. I was a good guy by the world standards. And uh, I was going to come to find out that, uh, you know, it isn't the world standards that God asks us to follow. It's his standard. It's his law. And uh, I, w I wasn't doing the best. I was, I was focused, laser focused on caring for my family 
and, and providing treasures. And I was not at all focused on uh, building treasures for the kingdom. Uh, so I ended up being trapped in that car for uh, two and a half hours. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the first paramedics, we, you know, like I said, we live out in the country. The first team got there and it took about 20 minutes and they didn't have the jaws of life. And when they saw me and realized that, that they were going to need to to cut me out, they called for the jaws of life. That took another 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> by that time, my wife, uh, she, my, my daughter had called my wife. She is, she was on the scene and, um, you know, when she looked at the, at the crash, it, it was, it was so unlikely that I was alive. The only reason that she knew I was alive was she could hear me talking in the background when my daughter called her. So he, she knew I was alive, but it, it was beyond her belief when she saw the vehicle. Mm. Um, and, uh, so they worked really feverishly, you know, for a long time. And, and, you know, I remember, uh, everything they did was a failure. They would cut a piece of the car away and it didn't help. Uh, they would cut another piece and it didn't help. And you'd hear the, the firemen and the paramedics that be cursing and I'd, I'd be giving them encouragement. It's okay. You know, you keep doing it. You're doing a great job. And, uh, at some point about, like I said, about two and a half hours into it, a paramedic, uh, comes into the car and he says, okay, we've cut away as much as we can. And, uh, you're still trapped. you my legs, uh, both of my legs were were crushed into an area that was too small for one leg, but both of them were in that. So there was no way to cut that out. And so he said, I'm going to sedate you. And then we're basically going to pay, play tug of war and, and we're going to pull you out. And uh, so they did. They sedated me, which I I tried to maintain some humor. I, I asked him, why didn't you sedate me two hours ago? You know, mm. but uh, there was a lot of concern that I wouldn't. Uh, keep breathing. Uh, part of that was the, the, the steering wheel was buried into my chest. I couldn't even see the steering wheel. Um, and the, the whole car just collapsed around me. Um, there's a picture on, uh, I believe the back cover of my book that uh, shows the door is kind of bowed in half. Mm. And, uh, and that is, that was actually from the impact of my body. I, I bowed that, <laughs> that steel door nearly in half as I was halfway out and I was wedged in the pillar behind the it separated the front and back. So they got me out and put me in the, uh, an ambulance while they were working to stabilize me and, uh, waiting for me to get into the life flight to get to the, to the hospital. And, uh, and so it was, uh, uh, I, you know, we got to the hospital. It was, it was late. I mean, but by th- this happened in the evening around five 45 with, with everything that went on. I don't think they did the first operation on me until after midnight. Mm. And this is, uh, it's a story of absolute miracles. I mean, just miracle after miracle. And, and, and as I've learned, um, you know, God does not place these hardships in our life, but he does indeed place blessings within them, gifts within them, and he prepares us for them sometimes decades in advance. And uh, one of those things was that when I was a young boy, I started training with heavy weights and I built my muscles and to the point where my skeleton grew incredibly strong and I was very bulky and very in, uh, and I'm a kind of a short guy. And, and, and they, they tell me that any other guy shaped any other way would have never been able to survive. So it's like, I was the perfect guy for that wreck. Mm-hmm. Um, they fly me to a hospital in Indianapolis where they take the Indy 500 race crash victim. So those guys have worked on guys just like me. Mm. Um, it, again, uh, anywhere else in the country, they tell me that this m- wouldn't have had the same outcome. You know, they didn't know what was wrong with me. So when they got me in, uh, to the hospital, they did a bunch of scans and I was sedated at this point. I didn't know. And a lot of this I get from my wife as she explains it, but I'm, I've got a list. If it's okay, I'll read what was wrong because at a, at a certain point where I said I was in pain, I'm going to talk about pain a lot more. And, and sometimes, you know, pain's very relative and we don't, your pain and my pain, you know, what I'm, what is a 10 for me might be a five for you. And, and so, but if I tell you the injuries, we all kind of kind of understand what an injury would feel like. Yeah. So and if I can right. just preface that by saying, when I read through your injuries, what you were yeah. going through, I mean, I've worked in the hospital, I've worked in the healthcare field. Yeah. Uh, I've worked in ER. That would be death for yeah, yeah. just about anyone. 
Yeah, it, there there were injuries uh, that uh, didn't have names because no one survived them, mm-hmm. and so so it starts off with a ruptured spleen, and it was a I think it was a level four, level five, whatever the highest level is. I don't I don't know, um, but it has a twenty minute lifespan without without surgery. So uh, again, it was almost five hours, I think that mm-hmm. I had this spleen that was so ruptured, so disintegrated. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had abrasions and uh, cuts and bruises on multiple organs. Uh, both lungs were collapsed. Uh, eight ribs were broken. The intercostal muscles, those are the rib muscles, you know, between the ribs uh, on the left side, they were all herniated out. And that that is one mm-hmm. of the injuries that doesn't have, that's a blunt force trauma injury that is uh, so far, I'm the only living person that survived that blunt force injury. It doesn't even have a name. Um, my painful. left, uh, forearm was, was broken compound fracture. And then the bone was sheared off, uh, cartilage, mm. uh, ligaments and tendons in both wrists were, were damaged. Uh, the ulna in the right arm, the forearm was driven into my right hand, uh, dislocated and shattered left hip, uh, compound tibia and fibula. That's the lower two leg bones, compound fracture. Those bones were sheared off. The skin on my back was torn off, uh, 10 fractured vertebrae, six herniated discs, and uh, I developed, uh, uh, they call them trauma-induced cataracts. It was where the lenses in my eyes were damaged from the impact. And so that, <laughs> that mm-hmm. was everything. So at some point, I'm going to say uh, I was in pain. Wow. <laughs> so Understatement. That's why. Yeah. yeah. Um, but my first memory after they sedated me was, was waking up on the operating table. And uh, I mean, I remember looking right in the eyes of the surgeon and you know, his big light behind him, you know, and, and all I could think, there's a breathing tube in my way. But all I could think was that there was so much pain that it would have been easier to choose death. And I, I, I caught myself that like, that surprised me. And I thought, wait a minute, did I have a choice? And as I'm thinking this, I see him turn his head and he says something. And then next thing I know, I'm back, my eyes closed and I'm back out. And I'm assuming he... <laughs> was probably very surprised to see me wake up while he was doing something to me. <laughs> so mm. um, they put me back <laughs> under. But but when I woke up again with that memory and I thought, why why did I think that I chose this? And, you know, I, it, it, was a, it, it, it perplexed me. Mm. Um, and, you know, but they told my wife, you know, the first, they weren't sure I was going to live. Um, and then after the first night, if, you know, I lost a lot of blood, my blood level was, uh, I, I was, I was empty. <laughs> Again, they don't know how, they don't know how I was still working, but I, 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 w- I was empty. Um, and there was, there was a lot of worry about that. Um, and, uh, and for some reason, they, they, they never explained it to us, but they absolutely did not want to do any blood transfusions. And, and hmm. it was never explained why, but it just, it wouldn't be good if they did. Hmm. And, Again, no explanation. So that was where it was touchy for a few days because I was way below a livable level uh, on my blood. Um, but they told us that uh, I would be in in the hospital for months, and then I would be in rehab for months in, in the hospital. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they they you know they said I would I would never walk again. I definitely would never fly again. I uh, all these things, right? They said I would be addicted to the drugs, that I would go through depression. I would do all of the, all these horrible things. And that's what we had to look forward to. Mm. Um, and just a, as a spoiler alert, I, I spent seven days in the ICU, four days in a step down unit, seven days in rehab. And it was only seven days because I recovered so quickly. They didn't order my wheelchair and all the home equipment. I would have been out in six days, but um, mm. 18 days from the, from the moment of the wreck, 18 days later, I was home. <laughs> that is an absolute impossibility and, and an absolute miracle. I can absolute. testify to that. You know, I it's, have, my son is in, uh, emergency medicine. He's an ER doc. Um, yeah. that just doesn't happen. That was no, a miracle. It, yeah, absolute miracle. A- absolute. And that was the one word. And, and you think about how, the, the things that happened to me, how they affected the people around me. You know, there's a lot of non-believers or very lukewarm believers all around us, especially for some reason in hospitals. 
right? I mean, that's like the place where probably the most miracles end up happening. And there's so many non-believers there. Mm -hmm. But that was the one word that everybody said was, well, that's just miraculous. Every time something would happen, <laughs> that's just miraculous. This yeah, is you have a lot of doubting Thomases in the hospital. Yeah. And clinicians and, and, and scientists. Yeah, right. And, and I look at it and I say, well, you know, this was an opportunity. They got to see it at what should be a dead man leave the hospital in, in 18 days. Right. I mean, like hmm. it's impossible. Um, so the, you know, the first seven days I was in the ICU and, um, we didn't really know about the damage on my back. So the, t the, the way the impact, it pushed me across my seat and then across that metal uh, bar that separates the front and back. And it absolutely tore all the skin off my back. But mm. I had been laid, laid on my back for 18 days. No one ever looked at it. And I couldn't move. With all the, dan the 10 broken vertebrae, eight broken ribs, eight, six herniated did they just laid me flat. Mm. I was flat the whole time. And... And I had traction on my legs, pulling my hip back into place. And, and every hour or so, they'd have to pull me up. And that bloody mess would get stuck to the sheets. And at some point, they just stopped and put it on a rubber mat. And it would just put, and I would scream. And just so mm. there was so much humiliation, you know, it, that it, being a, a, a strong man, and the men in the audience will, you know, we, we grow up in a world where like we, we're supposed to be strong and macho and, and, and then I'm, I'm, I'm weaker than a baby. I can't do anything for myself. I can't feed myself. I can't, I can't go to the bathroom. I can't do anything on my own. And, and then they would move me and I would, I would scream out in pain. And it was uh, so humiliating. Mm. Um. But I would find that that was part of the lesson that I was uh, being uh, being shown by the Lord. Um, but the, the the pain uh, the pain was intense, mm -hmm. and you know when I was in that car, trapped and suffocating, and in all that pain, I started I started telling myself that I can make it one more second. I can make it one more second, mm -hmm. and I said that second after second and i said that for the first probably 11 days second by second is what i lived i can i could not set a goal if they told me that i was going to have surgery in two hours i couldn't even comprehend how long that would be in the pain i was in mm. it was second by second one more second and i was absolutely saturated with pain when i say saturated with pain my senses were, were so overloaded that when someone new walked into the room, the stimulus of me seeing them caused such anguish. It was like my mind was saturated with, with however pain works in your brain, that seeing one new thing w was almost enough. Like I, I wanted to just be able to run away, but I, but I, was, I might as well have been paralyzed. Although here's the other miraculous thing here. <laughs> in all of that, I didn't have, with all that damage to my spine, no spinal cord injury, no, um, mm. no brain damage. I didn't even have a concussion. Absolute impossibility, you know. Um, but, so my mind was completely functional, and, but, but the pain was absolutely saturating. And, and any little, like if somebody wanted to touch my hand, even if it was a part of my body that was not hurt, I would scream out in pain because it was like it was another stimulus and my body didn't know what to do. Mm. Um, so the first week, seven days in the ICU, you know, you were absolutely surrounded by nurses, doctors. I had, you know, my wife and her brother, they would stay with me during the day. And then my brother and a friend from FedEx, uh, we, we work, well, we've been friends since, high, for, since college. Um, we've worked at every airline <laughs> together. Uh, he just happened to be on a trip in Indianapolis starting it that day. And, and my wife called him because I, she had to let FedEx know I wasn't going to be in the work uh, for a long time. Um, and he asked her what hospital I was going to. He was down. He was just down the street from it. So he walked in to the hospital and, and he was there before I was. And he's, he lives in Chicago. The impossibility of him being there. And then 
And then FedEx, uh, a, a gentleman there that he called into, he changed his trip around. He kept them there for a week so that he could be by my side for a week. And that, that's something. Mm. Uh, so him and, him and my brother stayed with me at night. So I was, man, I was so well cared for between the doctors, the nurses, and, and all of my family and friends that, that were with me for seven days. Um, and finally, after the seventh day, you know, uh, seven surgeries in seven days. Uh, and uh, let's see, to date, I'm, uh, I just had my 23rd surgery in April. So hoping that's my last. But uh, um, that, uh, that night, you know, going into the step down unit, I, everybody was so tired. And see, that was another thing. Another pain that I got to experience was everybody that looked at me, the fear that was in them. Oh, my gosh, the, the fear in their face. You know, like my wife, my brother, her brother, the doctors, the nurses, like everybody looked at me like, you know, they knew I was a goner. Like they were afraid. Mm. And that that was so painful because this is something. And again, it, it goes back to helping me with the timing of how all of these experiences that I'm going to tell you about in a bit. I knew when I was in the car that I wasn't going to die. I knew it. It was a fact. And it wasn't some sort of a macho thing. And it wasn't like delusion. I don't know how I knew it, but I knew I was going to live. And when I was in the hospital, I also, I knew I was going to live. It was a God thing, although I didn't know it at the time. So I, uh, the, the, when we get into the step down unit, I, I tell my family, I said, look, you guys are exhausted. I'm out of the woods. We know you, we, we, everybody knows I'm living now. And so everybody take the night off, get some rest. I'll be fine. And, um, I, uh, I sent everybody home and it was later that evening around 11 o'clock. You know, it was one of the things that I, the nurses, when I got into the lower units, they always wanted to put the TV on for me. Hey, can I put the TV on for you? And I no, gosh, please don't put the TV on because that stimulus would have been too much to handle. And so the nurse had just left and it was a very small one bedroom cinder block room that I was in, no windows. Um, and right below the TV, I'm looking at the cinder block wall, you know, down towards my feet. And there's a, a small square of just brilliant, bright light. Like, you know how like some people have their cell phone light turned on too bright and it's just like, you can't even look at it. And I, I look at this and I'm like, what is that? And as I look at it, I am transported through it. And it's just all around me is just the most intense bright white light that, that you could imagine. And I, it's like a, it's like a backwards tunnel where like a tunnel is dark and there's light at the end. This is light and there's dark at the end. And I'm coming up on that darkness. And as I come out on the darkness, I, I'm, I'm in a, I'm in this room and I'm looking down on a scene and, and I, I suddenly remember that this is a memory. This is not happening. This is like, I'm suddenly remembering it for the first time and I'm looking at it. And then next thing I know I'm in it and I'm living it, but now it's like, it's the first time. It's not a memory. This is like, it's live. And uh, the first thing I notice is that my vision is so clear, crystal clear, clearer than it has ever been. And it made me realize that living in this world seems like uh, when you're underwater, and it's kind of all cloudy. And then like you, you come up for the first time and it's like, wow, it's so much clearer. This was like levels and levels clearer than I've ever seen before. Mm -hmm. And I realized that life was, was hazy and it was fake, but where I was, it, that was real. And I knew, and this is strange, but I knew it was forever. I knew that it was eternity. Time did not exist. And again, I don't, I can't quite explain how I knew that, but I knew that I was outside of time. I had an absolute profound knowledge of everything in the world. And I've, I've explained it to people. People have asked me like, what, what do you mean by that? I mean, every volume of every book that was written, I knew. I didn't have to think about it. I just knew it. I had like just uh, everything of this world. I understood and I knew. 
I could see all around me, 360 degrees, you know, left, right, all around. I, but I could not see my body. Uh, I could not move. I was paralyzed. Uh, again, there was no body to be paralyzed. That's probably why it felt that way. Um, and then I realized that I was alone. And I was alone for the first time in my life. See, I'd never realized, I was 46 years old, I never realized that God holds our soul in his hand. And he holds it a particular way. He holds it like, like this, right, in our soul. And, he, and, and, and his touch, his hand, it protects us from all the evil, from entering from the back and from the sides where we can't see. And I understood that if evil was to enter, it had to come in through the front, and we had to invite it that the Lord protected us from our blind sides from evil. Mm -hmm. And see, he had held my soul. And, and again, I knew, I understood that uh, this is one of those times that I'm not special, right? I'm not different. He's holding your soul and he's holding everybody that's watching this. He's holding all of our souls. I didn't know it. I had no idea. I went my whole life. But if you could imagine, if, if you want to grip your arm like this, right, and, and you just hold it for like, even if you hold it for 10 minutes, and when you let go of that, all you feel is that absence, that grip is gone. I could feel it on my soul, the absence of God's hand. And it was, again, now these words, anytime I leave the world and I go to this, to this other world, the, the words in English, in human language, they are just so inadequate. I mean, it, I, I'm going to use the, the words that are either the best or the worst, however you want to look at it, that I can come up with. But I assure you that they are thousands of times inadequate to what I'm telling you. But to feel the absence of God at hand, to have God remove himself from you was horrifying. Horrifying to the point that as I speak to this, the hair on my arm is standing up. I have goosebumps because it it was horrifying. The, the pain of losing God. Mm. And now I said I was alone, but, but there was a, I call it an entity. It was a being. He was behind where I was. His back was to me. I can see him in my mind, but for some reason I can't make the, I don't know what he looked like. But I can see him in my mind as clear as day. But if I were to, it's there's like a block. I like I'm not allowed to tell you what he looked like. But he was behind mm -hmm. me, and um, I I knew that he would tell the truth. Uh, I knew that. Um, I I could feel him. Um, he did not love or hate me. If anything, I felt an indifference. Hmm. Now, I had always heard that hell was the absence of God, right? And, and I used to think, well, that's not bad. I mean, like, God's not here right now. So hell wouldn't be bad. See, but I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know that God was holding me. But here I knew, and he was gone. And so I thought, God's not here. So I asked that, that being, I said, is this hell? And he flatly said no. So I'm, I'm Catholic, so in the hierarchy of things, the next step would be, am I in purgatory? And again, he, he gives a slight chuckle, and a chuckle that you would give a child that doesn't understand because I was just grasping at straws. And I would later understand uh, through my study, uh, and, and I, I was such a poorly catechized Catholic, and that, for the, for the non-Catholics out there, the, the catechism is sort of the, our a big book of explanations of the faith. And as a Catholic, we should learn that. And it helps us to understand the Bible and the reasons we do the things we do, like, like the sign of the cross and what that means. And, it, it, but I, I, I've never, it was not an interest of mine before. I didn't know it. I didn't understand. And, you know, we believe purgatory is a place that you can go and, and burn off your sins. But one of the things that the souls in purgatory, we believe, can do is that they can pray. They know of God. They know that they are saved and they're just uh, they're uh, cleansing themselves to be with him. That's our belief of purgatory. Uh, see, I didn't understand all of that. And I, 
I was in this place. And, and, and he says, no, this is forever. Mm. I didn't want to be in forever. Hmm. And I said, well, how do I get out? And he said, that is up to you. I said, well, what do I do to get out? And he said, that is up to you. And then he's gone. Hmm. And now I'm, I'm truly alone. I'm without God. And it, to be timeless, right? So it's, it's a stark terror that I have running through me right now because I've lost God. And to be timeless means, see, like, if somebody were to bust into the room right now, you know, we would be startled. And then time would pass. The fight or flight mechanism would k- kick in. We would do something. We would react. And it would dissipate. We would see, oh, it's a friend, and it's okay, and we would relax, and time would pass. But no, in a timeless world, I was in this stark terror of this startle that would be forever. It would never diminish. It would never change. It would never subside. I was able to uh, look around the room for the first time, and it was a small cylindrical room, I don't know, six or eight feet across round. It was completely covered with uh, small doors, uh, doors of different sizes. They all had flat handles. Not that I had a hand that could open them, but it was such a high gloss red. Just, it hurt your eyes to look at. And again, everything was so crystal clear. And then the ceiling was like a, like a translucent white. And on the other side of it was this red viscous liquid. It, It looked like blood. And it was just sort of churning slowly around. And it, once I looked at it, I was horrified and I could not take my eyes off of it. And as I looked at it, there was a burning, a white hot burning in my soul, like burning down a, a, like a million miles deep. Like my soul was so much bigger than I ever understood it to be. And that, that white hot burning, it was ancient and old and familiar but it wasn't like anything i ever experienced but i knew it Hmm. i knew i could get out now here's the other thing i could feel the weight of my sin now i could not feel every one of them i didn't like see every one of them i felt the i felt the uh the total the sum total of all of my sin and it was like i was on the bottom of an ocean and it was crushing me and here's the thing i realized it, it was too late. It was too late. We get a chance in life and I squandered it and, and it was too late. There's no do-overs. There's no restart. This is it. This is where I belong. It was just. Where I was was just. I agreed with it. I realized that I, I was seeing myself with God's eyes. You know, we all have these we all have these things like I thought I'm a pretty good guy by the world standards, right? We're pretty good if we compare ourselves to the right thing. Uh, and, but there's no fooling. There's no, there's only truth with a capital T where I was. And I saw myself a whole life of myself of where I, what I had done. And uh, there was a regret and a remorse that I can't even begin to tell you. Oh my gosh. And there's and there's no doing over, and it's it. This is it. This is forever. So I knew I could get out. I couldn't move. I couldn't do anything. And I had all this knowledge. I had the knowledge of the world. So I started using it, thinking that if I used the right combination of knowledge, that I would somehow free myself. So I started with like math problems in my head, but they were like the math problems you see in the movies, like the chalkboard that goes like around the whole room. And like I'm doing these in my head. And I understand them and I'm completing them and I do all of it. I do all of math, (laughs) all of it. And then I move to poetry and I start reciting poetry that I don't know. I start doing the the works like Shakespeare and all all of that. And I run through all of it. I I, I do logic problems that things I don't even understand, but I, I worked all of the logic problems of Socrates and uh, it, it, but nothing I did. I, I did it until I ran out of knowledge. Now, I have no idea how long that would take. 
I mean, think about all of the knowledge in the world. If you were to think and recite it, and how long would it take you? There was no sleeping. There was no eating. There was no resting. There was only this. And in the background of this was this sheer terror, this panic of losing God. And I finally got to the end of it. And I said, this is it. This is a just judgment. This is where I belong. I am here because of what I did in life. This is fair and just. This is where I belong. And this is where I'll be the rest of my life. There is nothing I can do to save myself. And then that red viscous liquid, which I could not take my eyes off of, it changed in color. It got just like a little lighter. And then and I said, oh, my gosh, you're doing it. Keep doing it. And then all of a sudden, I, I said, no, you can't. You, you, you can't. you can't free yourself. And then it was as if I used to say the, the walls sort of came down. But as I've been contemplating about this, it, it's as if I've, I lifted up and I went through that red viscous liquid. And I, I have now starting to wonder if, you know, was that the blood of Christ? Was that, was that something that I needed to be bathed in that, that would free me? from my sin. I mean, it, theologically that, that works, right? I mean, that's, mm-hmm. I, I don't quite understand all of it. I wish I did. I, I don't, but I passed through this and now I'm in this lush green field. And when I say green field, it was not a natural green. I mean, this was like, <laughs> I don't even know if there's a green in the Crayola box. If you do the big box, <laughs> It's this color green, and it was beautiful. And I'm on this gentle knoll, and this tall green grass is so beautiful. And I'm looking up into a blue sky that was the most unnatural but most beautiful blue that I've ever seen. And there was just a peace that just it just flowed through me, and into it is so peaceful. Now that being that was with me before that had an indifference, he was back. Yeah. Uh, but this time I could, I could feel that he cared for me. I could feel love. And I said, am I out? And he said, you're out. And I said, is this real? And he said, this is real. And then everything went black. And then I'm in my bed. And I'll swear to you, if a second went by, I would be shocked. Mm-hmm. Now, I know I spent an eternity there. And one of the things that I thought about immediately afterward was I did all of that thought, right? I did all that thought, but I didn't do one thing. I didn't pray. And I didn't pray because Hmm. I didn't know prayer existed. See, I would come to understand afterwards that God, our, our prayer wells up from God. And without God, we cannot pray. And that's where I was. I was in a place without God. So although I knew of God and I knew that he was not with me anymore, I didn't know. I knew everything. I knew every word to every Shakespeare. I knew it, but I did not know prayer existed. Mm -hmm. And see, then as I start studying my catechism, I realize that the souls in purgatory, they can pray. And we believe they can't pray for themselves, but they can pray for you and me and they can pray for others. They know God. See, I didn't know God. Uh, It's horrifying. So I sit there and I think, this is a very stark realization. I think I might have died in the wreck. I think that that, I think this all happened at the moment of impact. And like a snap of a finger, God can have an eternity with you. Mm -hmm. And at that snap of a finger, I go somewhere and I make a choice. I wake up on the operating table, maybe thinking I made the wrong choice because of the pain. But somewhere in there, I went to that place. And it was it was a place that I believe I was able to uh, burn away the sins that it had accumulated in my life that I had never repented of. And there are a lot. I mean, I talk to people all the time that think, oh, I'm not, I don't really sin. <laughs> well, that's a sin right there. I can promise you, if you think you're sinless, you're 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 on the wrong path. We are all sinners, and uh, and we forget about a lot of our sins. We don't ask for the forgiveness, and I think that's what I was suffering. Mm. And 
But I thought, I don't think I'm going to heaven. Now, this is the guy that if you would have asked me 12 hours ago, are you going to heaven? I'd have told you, of course. And then I was in a head-on collision, and I didn't go. Mm. I do believe that it possibly for that brief second when I came out, the very green grass and that beautiful blue sky, maybe for just the briefest of moments, I got to be there. But um, it was beautiful, but uh, it was just a moment. Uh, mm. So, you know, the next day my brother came in, he was leaving, and I was pretty confused. I was starting to wonder, you know, that's the other thing that happened right afterwards is where I really got to see the spiritual battle for the first time, where I actually paid attention to it. It affects us every day of our whole life and goes mostly unnoticed by us. But see, as soon as I came out of that vision, a little voice in my head said, brain damage. It tried to justify what I just saw as coming from a damaged mind. Mm -hmm. And so it put that little seed of doubt. Now, I knew we did the tests. They did all kinds of tests. We knew I didn't have brain damage. But yet I still doubted it. I believed that it. it was a pretty sensational thing. I mean, nothing like I've ever experienced. Maybe it was brain damage. That's what I say. They asked my brother. I'm, I'm kind of confused. I'm like, hey, you know, am I alive? I, was, I felt like maybe I was still dead. I was so happy not to be in that red room, in that place of horror without the Lord, that I couldn't believe that I was alive, that I wasn't there, that I was there, I was going to be there for all of eternity. And we cannot, look, I was in timelessness, and I still can't fathom eternity, never ending. So uh, he leaves, uh, my wife is uh, coming in a little bit later, when she gets there, like, you know, the pain was pretty bad. But today, now, this is in the afternoon now, early afternoon. Uh, the pain is ratcheting up. It's really ratcheting up. Uh, you know, that was, my experience happened about 10 or 11 o'clock at night, the night before. I talked to my brother around 8 or 9 in the morning. Now it's early afternoon, and I'm just, I'm in agony. And uh, so I tell her, you know, that she's she's near me, and, and that close proximity is doing that sensory thing where it's just, making me want to scream because so I convinced her that she needs to go home and spend time with the kids. But in reality, I just needed everyone out of the room. They keep calling the nurses. They were, they were really good all the time about getting me my pain medicine on time. But for some reason I was way overdue. I was hours overdue. And, uh, mm. uh, when my wife was leaving, I said, Hey, stop at the desk and make sure they know I need my pain medicine. And so she did. And, they didn't come. They didn't come this evening now, early evening. And a new nurse comes in. He's a young gentleman. And as he's writing some things on the whiteboard, I said, oh, thank goodness you're here. I said, I'm so far behind on my pain medicine. And, and he turned around and he said, has no one told you? And I said, told me what? He said, there was a mistake made this morning. You were given too much of a certain medicine and you can't have anything for 24 hours. We can't give you anything until eight o'clock in the morning. Mm. He said, I can't even give you Tylenol. Mm. And I thought, oh my gosh, I had no idea how I was going to make it through the night. I didn't think the narcotics were working, but they apparently were doing something because uh, the pain was just, it was just out of control. And every minute it was getting worse. And then he did something and I, I tried to emulate it. Uh, he, he came and he sat next to me and started talking to me, not about a ho the hospital, not about, just about things. He told me that, that he travels from hospital to hospital every night and that uh, he wouldn't be back to this hospital until after I was home. Now, <laughs> I always wonder how he knew that. <laughs> hmm. He spent 45 minutes with me just talking and comforting me. So he spent so long with me that the guy that is literally like, you know, the mummy in the cast, you know, I'm head to toe bandages. I'm in agony and I am worried about him. I was like, you have so much to do. You need to move on. And he said, I have nothing else to do right now. And I think about that. And I try to do that in my own life to, to take a break from what I think is my schedule and 
try to do a little bit of God's work and just tell the people that I stop and talk to that there's nothing else I need to do right now except for what I'm doing I'm speaking to you. You know, and if I've often wondered if the man was an angel, uh, mm, and I was if he wasn't, ask you that, yeah. I, I, you know, I wasn't supposed to be out of the hospital for months. How did, how would he know that he was going to be back at that hospital? He goes to a different hospital every night. It just, right. he was a very thirty-year-old looking, slender, fit, handsome man, and I'm. I'm completely secure in my masculinity. I, I can I can say, <laughs> and he was a very just a kind, kind man. And I don't I don't remember his name, but um, it, it it's a lesson that if he wasn't an angel, it shows that we all have an opportunity to be someone's angel. And so I try to uh, show that compassion to others whenever I can. So I realize now it's a long night. It's again, it's maybe ten o'clock at night. 11 i don't know and it, i've got the rest of the night to go before i can get any payments and, and literally minute by minute it's getting worse and i decide that i'm going to try to close my eyes i i am positive i won't get sleep because this is like i feel like my whole body's in a meat grinder right i mean it's agonizing excruciating but i'm going to close my eyes and hope to pass some time with sleep and as i close my eyes it's as if I'm, I'm leaning out over an edge and looking into an abyss. And it goes on, it just goes on, this deep darkness. And in the bottom of this pit are all these creatures and they're intertwined together. And there's, I mean, just countless numbers of them. And it, there's, they have like reptile-like faces and multiple eyes and multiple mouths and they're covered in blood and they're they're wailing, this horrible wailing. And, it, and it's, again, the hair on my arm stands up and it, it's like soul crushing, so just horribleness. And again, these words, I, I, they just aren't words. Hmm. And I, I open my eyes and I'm back. I'm in my bed. And I close my eyes again. And I, I'm right back there. I'm leaning over the edge of this abyss, looking into the what I... What I know is the pit of hell. And the sound hmm. was this horrible sound and the, the sight, the wailing. The, oh. hmm. So I, I open my eyes again, determined not even to blink. And I start praying. I, I, I pray to, uh, to Jesus and I ask him to send the Holy Spirit to take these visions away. But I did not close my eyes again because I was a man of very little faith. I didn't think that he would send the Holy Spirit. So I'm afraid to close my eyes. And I decide that I'm going to start talking to Jesus. And, and I, I talk and he listens. We probably talked for about an hour. I talked to him and I said, you know, I never realized how much you suffered for me. Hmm. Said, your skin was torn off of your back. I said, my skin was torn off my back. He said, you're... Hands and feet were pierced with nails. And I said, my own body has been pierced with my own bones. So you hung on the cross and you suffocated for hours. And I was trapped in the car and I suffocated. I, said, I had no idea. I understood that Jesus was giving me just a taste of his passion, hmm. taste of his physical pain. And I, I, I just, we talked, we, we talked about his passion. And, and, and then I asked him, I said, I said, Lord, take this pain from me. And, and immediately, and then this is where I, where I tell you, it was my first experience where I truly understand that prayer comes from God. I prayed a prayer that was an absolute foreign idea to me. I had never heard it. I never thought of it. I didn't, never, didn't understand what I was saying. So I asked him to take my pain, and then immediately I say, no, you've carried my pain for me once. I said, I... I offer to carry my pain for you, for the salvation of the world, and for the salvation of lost souls. See, I didn't even understand that. I didn't even understand how I could carry my pain for the salvation of someone else. But I made that offering to him. We talked more about the passion. And then at some point, I, I absolutely, I forgot about those visions, that vision of hell. 
And I told him, I said, Jesus, I'm, I'm tired. I'm going to try to close my eyes and go to sleep. And I closed my eyes and right in front of me was this beautiful, and to say beautiful does not do it justice. This beautiful ball of light. It was like, like the size of a big softball, small grapefruit. And it was right in front of me. Beautiful. And I opened my eyes. And the voice says, brain damage. And I'm like, I have brain damage. So I go to, I, I try again. I close my eyes again. And it, 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 beautiful ball of light. I open them. Brain damage. And I go to press the call button with the only hand that still works. And just as my finger's getting on the call button, I'm in a very small room. There's a voice next to me in the chair, an audible voice. I can hear it with my ears. And it says, look at it. It is the Holy Spirit. Now, immediately I turn and look, and there's nobody there. And so now me, the man of little faith, knows that I have brain damage. (laughs) Hmm. And so as I'm ready to push that button again, that voice comes into my head and it pleads with me and it says, look at it. It is the Holy Spirit. Now I recognize that voice. Mm. That was a voice that I heard in my youth when I was a teenager as a lifeguard. And that voice helped me save a little girl's life. I should say that voice saved the little girl's life. And I knew that voice to be truth. And so I looked at, I, I listened to it and I looked at it. Now I do, I have to apologize. I'm saying it about the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is he. That's how we properly address him. However, I was so poorly catechized. It had that voice told me, look at him. I would have said, who? Because I, mm-hmm. in my mind, I wasn't seeing him. I was seeing a thing. It was an it, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the way I understood the Holy Spirit. I was horribly taught. So the voice spoke to me as I needed to hear. It spoke to me as I, so I would understand. So I do, from there here on, we will call him him. But at that point, that's what it said. It said, look at it. And, and so I did. And so when I looked at the Holy Spirit, I started to be transported out into what I'll call the vastness of space. And I realized I was traveling very far. And, and as I traveled to him, the, the Holy Spirit was growing greater and greater in size until, till as I, I say stood before him, but my, my body wasn't there. I, I think it was just my soul again. Uh, but as I stood before him, like he, he was enormous, just enormous and so bright, so incredibly bright and covered with this beautiful gossamer fog and it it cut just enough of the light out so that i could see him because without that fog there's no way i could look upon him mm-hmm. and the, and that gossamer fog that gossamer covering it was pulled at the poles north and south east and west and it formed the perfect symmetrical cross and it covered just enough of the light so that i could look at him and inside the holy spirit on on the surface he he looked he looked to me like the surface of a star, like when we see pictures of the sun. And we, but it was much more beautiful than that, and moving, and in a way that I don't, un, I don't know, but I understood that he was alive, he was living. It's so beautiful. Again, these words, I'm going to use these words, and I say that they're blasphemous, because to say that the Holy Spirit is beautiful is blasphemy, because he is so far beyond that word. There just is not a word in our language that can convey how beautiful he is. Mm. But he, the voice told me to look, and so I did. And I, I was able to go like around on all sides. And I remember thinking to myself, and this is, I remember feeling like when I was a child and you're peeking under the Christmas tree to see if any of the presents have your name on it, and you're afraid you're going to get caught. And I, and I don't know why I had that sensation of being like a child looking for presents. And, hmm. But the voice said, look, and I was, and I did, and I looked, and I looked for a long time. And I finally, I came on, and I, I just looked at him head along. And the first thing I noticed was power. There was power 
emanating from the Holy Spirit, but but it passed through me, but it didn't travel. Like the power, it passed through me, and I knew it reached to the edges of the universe, but it didn't travel there. It just was there. It's there always. And it, and it was like through me, and I could feel this power. And it was so vast, so vast. And I, I had such disdain for the enemy. Mm. There's such disdain that I refused to call him by name. So you know who I'm talking about when I say the enemy. Mm-hmm. And I thought, how could you fight this? How could you think you could win? I mean, here I am, a mere man with a mere human intellect, with this power that is so vast, so grand, so undefeatable. How could you possibly think you could win? And I was like, I had such disdain for for his pride on how foolish he was. And then scriptures started flooding me. And the first scripture was, it's like the, the scripture came to me and I answered it. And I said, oh, how easy it would be for God to pass a camel through the eye of the needle. With this vast power, anything is possible. It would be the simplest thing he did. So easy, so simple. And then another scripture flooded me and I, and I answered it and I said, Oh, yes. If just we had the faith the size of a mustard seed, just the tiniest of faith, when it was multiplied by this vast, infinite power, we could indeed move mountains. And then I, mm. I realized that the Christmas star, you know, I could never understand as a child how, how the, the wise men followed the Christmas star. I would go out as a kid and I'd look up at the sky and there were about a thousand stars over my house. And I'd think, how did they know which house to go to? But then I realized what I was looking at, it actually, it resembles those beautiful pictures we see at Christmas time of the Christmas star with the big spires. And I thought, well, of course, it started with one wise man. He he looks up in the sky and he sees the Holy Spirit. It looks like this beautiful star. And he says to someone else, do you see that? And they say, no, do we see what? I don't see anything. It's only shown to those who need to see it. And, and that wise man, he walks until he bumps into another guy looking up. And he says, oh, sorry, I was looking at it. And he says, you can see it. And then the three of them get together and they fall because it made sense to me. I could never understand. I'm like, why didn't Herod just follow the same star? Why did he tell the wise men, oh, tell us where the house is when you find it? Because Herod couldn't see it. And it was just like Jesus in his in his ministry. He showed himself to the people that he needed to show himself to. And to so many others, he was hidden. That's why he could walk up to an average fisherman mending his nets and say, follow me. And they get up and they leave everything and follow him. Because for a moment, he showed them who he was. Then I saw Jesus in the Garden of Geth- Gethsemane. And I... They came to arrest him and they say, are you Jesus of Nazareth? And he says, I am. And they all fall to the ground because he showed them this power. He showed them what I saw. And no man could stand in that power. And see, he did that. He did that for them and he did that for us. So he wanted them and us to know that they did not take him. They could not take him. He did it willingly. And then I could feel, I could feel love and it was permeating into me. It was touching me. Now, again, I didn't have a body, but I could feel it touching me like we feel rays of sunshine touching our skin. I could feel his love. And then I felt mercy in the same way. I could feel it physically. You know, we all have been loved. We know what it's like to feel like we've been loved. I'm not talking about that. I felt love like physical presence. I felt mercy, just like I felt the power. And as I meditated on it, I realized that afterwards that, that within the Holy Spirit, I felt the power of the Holy Spirit, the love of the Father, and the mercy of the Son all coming through the Holy Spirit to me. And I just wanted to say, stay there forever. It was just so peaceful and loving. And I wanted to be there forever. And I, I remember I could, where I, where I said before, I had the knowledge of the world in that red room. 
here in the presence of the Holy Spirit, I had the knowledge of what I will call the universe. And with the Holy Spirit, with, with that knowledge, I understood all the things of our faith that we call mysteries. We call them mysteries because of our lim limited intellect. They're beyond our grasping and beyond our understanding. But with my elevated understanding through the Holy Spirit, all of those things made sense to me. They were so simple. But of course, that didn't stay with me when I came back, unfortunately. Some things did. But I wanted to stay there forever. And I was able to kind of like look down and, and I saw my family and I knew they would be all right. I knew they would be okay. I knew that God would provide for them. They would take care of them. And I wanted to stay. And at that moment, one of those spires, one of those beautiful gossamer spires reached out and it came and it touched me in my soul. And as it did, I could feel myself pouring into the Holy Spirit. And at the same moment, I could feel him pouring into me. And again, these words are so pale, but I felt joy and love and happiness and bliss and ecstasy and every good thing. And it just was so intense. And it these words just don't do it. And it's so intense. And, and it kept getting bigger and bigger and more and more. And I, all I could say, I couldn't say anything, but all I could say was more. Mm. I wanted more. And he increased his pouring into me and I increased my pouring out into him. And until some point I lose consciousness and I wake up the next morning, the sun is already up. I ended up going the whole entire night pain-free. As a matter of fact, I was still pain-free. Pain and I didn't, I didn't start to feel pain again until after I took my first dose of pain medicine. And I often wonder, had I refused it, if I would have stayed pain-free forever. Mm. Wow. But, you know, that... The spiritual battle then, it stayed, it continued, it, it wanted to put doubt. And see, that's what the enemy does. When when we have these experiences of God, He anything that leads us closer to God, well, he's going to do something to to throw a twist in it, to 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 pull us off course, to and so I I denied it. I I disbelieved what happened to me for a year. And I started to research it. I tried to figure out, I went and I interviewed my doctors. I, I went to the paramedics. This is once I started driving, uh, which would be uh, months, three, three months later, I was, I was able to start driving, maybe, maybe four months. But I, I asked the paramedics, the doctors, if they had said things like you're out or this or that. And, you know, nobody said anything. I, I talked to anesthesiologists about the drugs that you take when you're sedated to see if maybe these were hallucinations caused by the drugs. And they assured me that uh, the, the drugs that you take for surgeries actually shut your brain down. It, it, it doesn't allow you to dream. As a matter of fact, it was, that's why we, we breathe for you. We, we do all that stuff because your brain's not working at all. So they assured me that nothing, I could have had no hallucinations from those drugs. You know, and they told me all of these things that would happen, all those bad things we talked about before, depression, alcoholism, the drug addiction. None of that happened. None of it. See, because I went to a place that was without God. That's the most horrible thing. As a matter of fact, you can't imagine it. It's mm -hmm. unimaginable. I experienced it and I shudder to think of it. And I still can't fully remember the horror. Thank God. But see, nothing that I went through, through my recovery, through my long, long years of rehab, nothing was as bad as being there. And if you were to give me the choice that I could be at that crescendo of pain that I felt in the hospital, then I would live for another 150 years and I would experience that for the rest of those 150 years, or I could choose one second without God, I would take the 150 years of excruciating pain and I wouldn't even blink an eye because it is so mm. unbelievable to lose him. Wow. And so there have been other experiences. And I, I believe that my message 
there's a few things to it. You know, I used to think that God was out there somewhere, that, you know, we prayed to him and sometimes he answered and sometimes he didn't, but he wasn't really here. And But he's not. He's here with us every moment of every day. He's holding each of our souls in his hand. That poem, that footprints poem where, where, you know, there's two sets of footprints and then when things get bad, there's only one. And, and, the, and the guy says, why did you abandon me every time things got that bad? And he said, oh, my child, that's, that's when I carried you. You're familiar with that, right? Yes. It, and I used to think, oh, that's kind of cheesy. That, that's not really how it works. But, you know, what I've been through, all of it is an impossibility. Mm-hmm. I went back to flying for 22 months. That was an impossibility. Mm-hmm. Now I'm out, I'm, I'm permanently disabled, and somehow, miraculously, God was able to mask the nerve damage that was there. I was able to go through work for 22 months, and then at the appropriate time, the nerve damage all presented itself, and it's grounded me. But, you know, I look back at what I went through, the length of time, six years, six and a half years of just torturous rehab, and I think, yeah, there is no way I could have done this on my own. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if I would have been on my own, I would have been addicted to drugs. I would have been an alcoholic. I would have had depression. I would have done all those things they said would happen. But see, I went to a place where I got to have the blessing of losing the Lord and seeing what that was like and then being able to come back. Mm-hmm. It reminds me so much. My experience reminds me of the Bible verse of, Lazarus the beggar and the rich man, only Mm. I got to be both of them, Mm. and I got to come back. Mm. I got to be the man that experienced hell, that lived a lavish life and went to a place of eternal regret. And I also got to be the man, you know, instead of Abraham, I'm I'm in the presence of the Holy Spirit, and I get to experience that glory. And then I get to come back, and I get to tell my brothers— Mm. of both of those places and that there's time to change to repent to, to to bring the lord into your life make room for him build treasures in heaven but not not here don't worry about it. this place is fake it's not real mm. there is an eternity that is real and you're going to you're going to spend it in a place of eternal regret or glory i, I wasn't in heaven I, I want to make sure everybody understands that. Maybe that brief moment where I was in that bl- beautiful grass, I don't know. But when I was with the Holy Spirit, I was not in heaven. So whatever heaven is, it's going to be even better than what I experienced. And if you told me that all I would ever get would be to stay with the Holy Spirit, I'd be there forever in a heartbeat. Mm. And that there is a pain. There's a pain associated with the sin that we that we hold on to in this life. And there's a, even a pain of us letting it go because Christ has to take it all. He has to take all of our sin. He's the only way into the kingdom. Yes. And so the more we sin now, the more that at some point we're going to be so regretful when we're at the feet of our Lord. I think that's probably the message to probably the most important. Yes. You know, the the profundity of what you're saying, Ed, is so compelling because you are expressing what all of those who think they may not be saved or they are saved and questioning where will I go or what will happen to me and the mercy of God and giving you that experience so that you could evangelize others with the truth. You know, yeah. Jesus, Jesus, the sacrifice on the cross, <clears throat> he didn't necessarily make it easy for us, did he? He made it no, eternal no. and with him forever. Well, well, there's so much scripture that says, you know, here's the thing. It's the lie of the enemy that tells us that this place where we are now, this is where it should be good. This is where it should be right. Mm -hmm. This is where it should be just. This is where it should be fair. But that's not what the Lord said. What did Mm -hmm. the Lord say? He says, 
if you, you know, to deny yourself, pick up your cross and come after me. He knew mm -hmm. there would be suffering. Mm -hmm. It's how we address the suffering. Look, I, I still, I don't talk about it a lot. My wife tells me I need to talk about it more because it might help people. I'm in constant pain. Mm -hmm. And I'm okay with that. Because, you know, there's a, I've continued that prayer of saying, okay, this pain is my cross. And I pick it up lovingly every day. And I imagine that, here's how I do it. I imagine that it isn't just my cross that I'm picking up, but it's his. I offer to be Simon of Cyrene, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm yeah. sure Simon was somewhat, somewhat uh, uh, not very happy about his mission at first. But I assure you, he was a changed man at the end. And, and so a lot of us are like that. A lot of us are afraid to pick up our cross. But I promise you, pick it up for him. See, suffering, um, people wonder about it, but it's great opportunity, right, to offer love to the Lord. And I'll explain how. So I always, I never understood how 2,000 years ago, Christ died for my sins when I wasn't born yet. See, but having exited time a few times, um, I understand now that, yeah, from the human perspective, that doesn't make sense. But see, God is outside of time. He views all of time at the same moment. So while Christ isn't dying every day, at any moment, at this moment, right now, God is seeing this moment while he sees Christ hang on the cross. And so at this moment, if I pray to the Lord and I say, Lord, I carry this pain, I carry it for you. Can you feel it? Can you feel my love? Then I believe he can. And that's how he is. That's how my sins that I'm going to commit tomorrow. Because when I'm committing them, the moment I'm committing them from God's perspective, he sees me committing my sin and he sees God, the son hanging on the cross. Mm. And so my friends, if you're suffering, if you have suffering, and I don't, it just isn't pain. There's all kinds of pain, physical, mental, spiritual. There's, there's all kinds of pain that we suffer. Consider the suffering as a gift that you are allowed now to walk with Christ on that journey while he's carrying his cross and say, Lord, let me carry that cross with you. And, you know, the funny thing about it is every time I do that on the days that are really bad, I swear to you, there are times that I feel like I can feel our heads together and his crown of thorns poking me. And I hear a little voice that says, just a little further. And it's the Lord that's encouraging me. Because, you know, when we, when we willingly pick up our cross and carry it for him, that's when he picks ours up and carries us. Mm -hmm. And And my goodness... St. Padre Pio used to say, he was a priest, in the, he died in the 60s, but he always would say, uh, suffering is, is a great gift from God for those who choose to use it wisely. Mm. And it really is. And we all suffer. Mm -hmm. If you're not suffering, well, you probably don't realize it. <laughs> well, Jesus um, said as much. He said we would have trials. Yeah. This is yeah. not home. It isn't home. It will be a home oh. and, in heaven, you know, and we are freed of all of these. And, and you know, the funny thing about it, I didn't mention this, when I was with the Holy Spirit, I realized that I was homesick. I knew that mm. place, and I had missed that place, and I knew it, and I wanted to go there. I still think about it. I'm so homesick because this isn't our place. This is where, you know, Adam and Eve, we were cast out of the garden. We were sent here to toil, and then... You know, now Jesus, the new Adam, he he brings the new tree of life. Mm -hmm. You know, where once we were not allowed to touch the tree of life and we were cast out of the garden. Now Christ comes and he brings us the new tree of life, which is his cross, which is our cross. And he encourages us to pick it up, carry it daily. And, uh, you know, that's when when you start doing that, you realize that you're not really suffering. You're, you're doing the work of the Lord. You're getting closer to him. That's, that's, you know, coming from somebody who has suffered and continues to suffer, that's just not, that's not just words. No. It comes from the heart. And I can testify as well, my brother, because I was, uh, I was out on the floor this past weekend and 
<laughs> I'm, I just came off uh, my breathing treatments before we talked. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, you know, it is an honor to represent God as it a is. broken vessel in this yeah. world, isn't it? It is. And you have said that there's a the Romans uh, 10, 9 through 11. I'll just read that very briefly, if I may, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess that you are saved. It's not a superficial acknowledgement. A true heartfelt confession is one that says, I give my all. I give my all to you, Lord Jesus. You are the only one. You are yeah. the only one yeah. for whom and, I sacrifice and, myself. And, and that's a, a problem in today's age with, I think, a, a lot of Christians. They believe, well, all I have to do is say I'm a Christian and I'm saved. But they're not, they're not living it. They're not, they don't, they're not professing it like you say with your heart, with your soul, right? They're just saying it. They're empty words. And I, I look, I was like that. I was, I, was, I was a Catholic. I wasn't the best Catholic, but I thought I was going to be okay and wasn't living. You know, uh, Jesus, the, the rich man comes up, the, the rich young man comes up to Jesus and says, Lord, what do I need to do to enter into the kingdom? And he says, obey the commandments, you know, and he says, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your being, right? And then he says, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And, <laughs> and then, of course, the guy says, oh, I've done all of that for my birth, which no one's done all of that from their birth, right? So, and Jesus looks <laughs> just, at him and he loves just lied. him. Because, he broke a commandment right there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And Jesus looks at him and loves him. Like, that's what the Bible says. He looks at him and loves him because he's like, he knows him. And he's like, I know, you know, you can't lie to me, right? <laughs> so, right. Um, and then he says, go and sell everything, right? And, and it doesn't, a lot of people think that means that you need to be poor. But what it is, is I, I, was, a, I was a rich man. I had a very high paying job. Um, and I had a lot of possessions that I loved. I knew, you could say I coveted my own possessions. And I realized that it wasn't me who owned my possessions, but they owned me. And they were what were important to me. And like, then I have this experience and they're meaningless to me. It's all meaningless to me. Take what you want. I don't care. I just want the Lord. Um, and that's where we need to we need to help our brothers and sisters to get to that point to realize that this isn't it. This place isn't the be all, have all place where all justice is going to be due. No. You know, I mean, the Beatitudes explain that probably way better than I could. Mm. Um but uh, the opportunity to, you know, I don't always have the opportunity to get to talk to a large audience. So um, th this is this is a wonderful chance for me to to tell my story. And 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 I think um, I I hope that the, your non-Catholic friends have hung in here long enough. I I know that some of my things are are definitely Catholic thoughts, but um, I hope that uh, we can understand, like you said earlier, that. Um, we, we all are loving the, the Lord. And, and for me, my goal, my, my goal now is, is that I don't know if I'll have to go back to that red room again or a place like that. And I, I pray not, but you know, the Lord will be the judge. Um, if I have anything to do with it, I pray that it's empty and that I'm the only one there because I, I don't want another soul to have to experience the loss of God. Mm. I cannot, I wish there was a way, that's one of my prayers uh, often is, is that I wish that I could let people feel what it was like to lose God and then feel what it was like to have the Holy Spirit touch you. Mm. Because either one of those is life-changing. It's mm. life-changing. Um, so. Yeah, and you knew you would come back. You knew I, knew I knew I wouldn't going, die. Going I, into it initially in the car, mangled yeah, up. I knew it. You and, knew it. And, you knew and, it. And, and, and again, it, it, the, the whole thing is I already knew that the world was fake and hazy. So the vision had already happened where my vision was clear. And mm -hmm. I still look at it. I still look at the world and, uh, and I say, 
oh, it's not anywhere near as clear as it was in that other place. I mean, mm-hmm. we, you know, and, and saints throughout the, the, the eons have, have talked about their experiences when they've had mystical experiences. And they've said that the, the world is hazy, it's foggy, it's cloudy. Mm-hmm. Um, because it is when the Lord's real world, his eternity is, is much different than this place. Oh, and it could be much better and it could be a lot worse. Yeah, I want everybody to feel the better part. I want them <laughs> to see that. Yeah. Dreams, visions, yeah. the esoteric, what you uh, are terming the mystic, which is a word we find not, not in some new age religion, but actually in, in miracles like the transfigguration, you yeah. know, so, yeah. where Jesus uh, was speaking with Moses, Elijah. Yeah. You know, all of those ethereal, ethereal experiences that mm-hmm. are a part, seeing the, the fig tree that bore no fruit withering away, that defies mm-hmm. nature, anything that defies mm-hmm. nature, that enters into right. the realm of, of oh, God's yeah. realm. Yeah, and like God's said- realm, apart from, far from, apart from God's realm, too, because you uh, mm-hmm. indicated to us uh, hell. Yeah, which, you know, God created everything, so that means that He created hell as well. I mean, it's, it's. Um, I mean, He's not there, <laughs> mm-hmm. which what makes it hell. Um, but all of creation, right? So um, that's, I believe. And again, I don't think I went that red room. I don't believe was hell. And what I really believe that red room was was a preparation, because at some point. I was going to stand in the presence of God. I was stand in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I had a, I had a dirty soul. Mm. It needed cleansed, but I didn't die. And so I couldn't go through whatever process would have happened if I died to receive the Lord's mercy. So he created a place for me to cleanse myself, to learn some things, to show me some things, to, to give me a taste of what hell would be like. Um, Mm. uh, and uh, I pray that no one would need to have that. Let's, I'd, I'd rather everybody just make it to, to heaven and not have to go through that. Mm-hmm. Um, That's our prayer. Yeah. That's our prayer yeah. that everyone watching this will know that you know. Yeah. Because not only have you confessed with your mouth, but you believed in your heart. Yes. And you've given your all just as Christ gave his all for you. Uh, we know that you're, the Mystic Next Door is available on Amazon, where I got it, but I was going to get it through your website. To tell us yeah, about your so, website and also where where we can get your book. Yeah, so um, it's available on my website, uh, which is uh, Presence of God Encounter. So that's P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E of God. I always capitalize the G just to make Google upset. <laughs> uh, presence of God encounters.com. I know it's a long name, uh, but if you go on there, uh, there's various links all over to get the book and you can get that through me. It's, it's um, I give the book away um, and uh, there's a suggested donation, but if, if you can't make that donation, just there's a contact, hit the contact page, tell me you can't afford it. I'll send you a book. Um, and if you want the book, suggested donation is, is much less than Amazon. Uh, Amazon makes a lot of money on the book, and um, that was never the intention. Um, my my goal is for any book that I um, happen to get a donation for, it pays for one book to give away. So when I do my talks, which I, I you know I'll, I'll come to your church, and I've I've spoken at just as many uh, non Catholic churches as I am Catholic churches, and uh, I will speak anywhere, anyone. I'll speak to one person, or I'll speak to ten thousand. Uh, I will tell this story to anyone who wants to hear. And whenever I do a talk, I give my books away for free. I've never charged for my books, so the the website is really just a way for me to try to help. Um, not go broke. <laughs> the Lord, is, the Lord has yes. been uh, very good. He He always seems to provide, and people are always so generous to help me with my ministry. Um, so, uh, uh, but yeah, so Presence of God Encounters uh, dot com. Again, it is available on Amazon. I'm going to keep it on there just for the sheer fact that look, it's all about saving souls, and you never know how the Holy Spirit's going to influence somebody 
who's going to be searching Amazon and say, oh, what's this? And they're going to buy it. So I still want to make it available there. I'd much rather you you come to me and get it um, and save money on your own end. So very and, good. Uh, but uh, well, yeah, we I'd will... love to come and talk and I'll, I travel. I'll do whatever. Yeah. Good. Well, support our brother, please. Uh, you can go to his website. We'll have a link to that uh, website here on the body of this message, and you'll be seeing that perhaps on your screen as well. Uh, I so appreciate you, brother. Uh, well, we're of a, a common blood, aren't we? Yes, sir. We are. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I tell you, see, I appreciate you. This is a very hard message to get out. And you can see why some people are uh, maybe worrisome about it, right? And it, it, uh, But uh, it... It's one of those things, until you hear it, people are leery of it. Then once they hear it, they say, wow, that that's quite a message. Um, so, mm -hmm. I, yes, we are. It, it, we, uh, in our conversation before this, you could I, I knew instantly. Uh, and I'm so glad. I, I'm always amazed at how the Lord works. The um, I, I don't know how you got the book, but I know I got an email from a person who I don't know who who read the book. And contacted me, and he said, "You should, you, should, you should give Randy Key a, a call." I, I didn't even know. I, I've never heard of you. I'm sorry, but I, <laughs> I, um, I tend to shy away from near-death experiences. I, I try not to listen or read about them because I don't want in any way for it to subliminally uh, affect my story. Right? I, I want to mm -hmm. sort of like just, I just want to tell what the Lord showed me. Um, so I was unaware. And then I, once, once he gave me and we set this up, I started looking, you do have a lot of, so if this is the first video you've, you're going to see of, of, uh, Randy, look at his other ones because he has a lot of good ones. Um, and you are doing good work as well. And, uh, there's an awakening happening. Um, I was shown that, uh, that the, we, the, the lie of the enemy is, is that the, the evil is everywhere and it's, it's overtaken the world, but, um, when you look at it, it is actually very small and it's very weak. And that there is a wave of God's goodness coming that's going to wash it away. And that wave of God's goodness is is God's children. Mm -hmm. And there is an awakening happening. And um, this is part of it. You're a part of it. Um, and there are stories like mine out there. I've never I've never shared my story and not have somebody come up and have a story to tell that they're afraid to tell. So brothers and sisters, tell your stories about God. We need to be talking and telling these miraculous stories that are in all of our lives. We do, and we need to get over don don denominational barriers. Yes, yes, we do. If we don't do that, I believe God's displeased with us. Yes. Uh, we are fighting amongst each other exactly. when the world is fighting us. Yeah. We've got to come together. Yeah. We're of one belief, foundational yes. belief in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So unless we do that and unite as a body in Christ, we're, dis we're a dismembered body. Yes. So oh we don't want to be that. We want to be a whole body with Christ as the head of that body. That's right. So which he Randy, is. I prayed about this today. I mean, it can't be by chance. I, I don't believe in coincidence. And I really believe that this message it, it was given for that reason is to unite us together. And there really are, there are really people that they won't speak to another denomination if they know that that person is of a, a and my, I mean, my God, you know, Jesus does not want that. He never mm -hmm. wanted that. And yeah. we, we need to love each other. Look, it's a war. It's us against the enemy. And, you know, that was one of the other things that I, when I was with the Holy spirit, I realized that, you know, the war is not between God and the enemy. That war was fought and won handily. He was, the enemy was cast out. And now that war has shifted between the enemy and God's children. It's between us. It, that's where the war is. And, and if we're warring among ourselves, then we are weak. And uh, we're susceptible. So, brother, I thank you. And uh, I love you, man. I love all of you. And we need to love each other. Well, I love you too, brother, and uh, and we love each of you who are watching this. And thank you again, Ed. And we have some uh, great news in parting. 
And that is, if you are indeed in Christ Jesus, then be of good cheer because heaven is in your future. Until Amen. next time, take Thank care. You. Thank you, Randy. God bless. Thank you, God bless you. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.